please welcome Paul LeClaire, member of the Teachers College Board of Trustees. As a trustee of Teachers College, which is a very high honor indeed, I have the privilege of opening today's doctoral hooding ceremony and the pleasure of being the very first to congratulate the 2018 graduates of our great Teachers College. The diplomas that you'll receive today are not just rewards for the courses, the research, and the dissertations that you've completed so successfully. Because they are TC diplomas, they are proof that you have collaborated with some of the best minds in your field in creating and discovering new knowledge. That you, have that you have developed new ways of understanding complex challenges and phenomena, and that you have what it takes to become outstanding scholars, leaders, and change makers. TC graduates are dedicated to increasing human well-being both inside and outside of schools and classrooms and across the lifespan. That's why so many of you will change lives as scholars and researchers, as principals, superintendents, and district leaders, as psychologists, counselors, and physiotherapists, as artists and art administrators, as college presidents, as nonprofit executives, and as so many other important and world worthwhile things. For more than 130 years, teacher co teachers college scholars have discovered new ways to understand the complex forces that shape our minds, our bodies themselves, and our relationships with each other and with the world around us. Teachers College faculty have created entirely new fields of inquiry, educational psychology, conflict resolution, international and comparative uh, education, social studies education, special education, nutritional education, organizational psychology, and many, many more that you yourselves will now advance in your own distinct and brilliant ways. Today, nearly one third of TC's faculty are psychologists. And we offer at Teachers College more than 100 programs in education, in health, in psychology, and in leadership. All these progr programs share a single and terribly important aim, to help individuals and communities reach their full potentials. Making all of this possible and helping Teachers College itself reach its full potential requires extraordinary leadership at the top. Thankfully, we at Teachers College, you all, have benefited with truly brilliant and astonishingly brilliant leadership at the top for the past 12 years. Please join me in a rousing welcome for the truly extraordinary president of Teachers College, Susan Furman. Good afternoon. Welcome to a most joyous occasion as we honor the talented women and men who have already achieved so much and in some ways are just getting started. Please join me in congratulating the 2018 doctoral candidates of Teachers College. Graduates, let's hear it for those who helped you make it to this day, our outstanding faculty and dedicated staff. And let's all show our appreciation to your families and partners for their love, encouragement, and support. It's a special thrill for me to participate in the hooding of our doctoral students because when I received my doctorate at TC, 41 years ago. <laughs> I don't think we had a hooding ceremony, at least I don't remember being invited to one. 
And I've always thought that hooding was a particularly powerful image of joining the full-fledged ranks of academia. It's also a joy to see so many children here. By the time I earned my TC degree, I had three of my own. And I know that's so very much a part of the doctoral student's life, particularly at TC, where children and families figure so prominently in our work. Just as an aside, now at my last TC convocation ceremony, I also have three grandchildren. Family is the core of faculty and administrative life also. Graduates, you now join the ranks of our doctoral alumni who are leaders in education, psychology, and health. Like them, you now have great power. You have the power to reshape and energize the learning, caring, and research environments where you work. You have the power to produce groundbreaking research, pedagogies, and evidence-based policies and solutions. You have the power to build new bridges of understanding and productive engagement with diverse communities and cultures throughout the world. You have the power to improve productivity and performance at organizations. You have the power to lead the revolution in educational technology to benefit learners of all ages. And like our alumni, you are dedicating your lives and careers to the pursuit of social justice. A TC tradition that literally goes back to our founder, Grace Hoadley Dodge. Grace Dodge was among the leaders of a growing movement in the late 19th century to provide educational and social opportunities for low-income and marginalized populations. Like her contemporary Jane Addams, who founded settlement houses where people from different socioeconomic backgrounds could share ideas and information, Grace was bound and determined to improve the lives of struggling families. It was her unique vision to establish a college that would prepare teachers to work with immigrant students and their families who had recently fled poverty, war, and prejudice and were still encountering xenophobia and economic peril. It was also Grace Dodge's brilliance to recognize the need for a new kind of educator, one with the skills, cultural understanding, and self-awareness to understand and address immigrants' educational, health, and psychological needs. Armed with this deeper knowledge, this new type of educator could help immigrants in their communities achieve economic mobility and social equality. Thanks to Grace Dodge, Teachers College quickly became a force in increasing educational opportunity as a path to greater social justice. But also implicit in Grace's vision was another TC hallmark, the value of research as a driver of innovation and progress, and the notion that for all of us at the college, regardless of our field of study or career path, evidence guides and informs our scholarship and practice. Indeed, research has been at the heart of TC's preeminence virtually since our founding. Not only have TC faculty and alumni produced knowledge that has contributed to the betterment of society, in many instances, their research led to the creation of new fields that revolutionized education, health, and psychology, and continue to deepen our understanding of the world. In my other convocation remarks, I spoke to our master's graduates about the inestimable value of research in their professional education and the role it will continue to play in their careers. Doctoral graduates, I don't need to stress the importance of research to you. You live research. You know research. Your completion and successful defenses of your dissertations prove that you can produce research that meets very rigorous standards. Nor do I need to remind you that outside the academy, research in the social sciences is often demeaned as irrelevant, or belittled as useless, or just ignored altogether. Here's what I'd like to suggest in this, my final doctoral convocation remarks. The way you design and execute your research matters. It bears directly on the quality of that research, and it matters when it comes to the credibility, reputation, influence, and impact of that research on public policy, on practitioners, on the public good. 
I know that politics and values often lessen the influence of research on policymaker and practitioner action. But my studies and observations of research use and scholarship over the last 40 years have led me to believe that the quality of the research is a key variable. First, research must be driven by questions that need answering. Questions derived from past research, from the needs of potential users, from the researcher's curiosity. The question must drive the research design. Too often, we see researchers become attached to their favorite methods. They want to do an ethnography, or they want to use a particular large-scale database that has become available. Before any decision about methods comes designing the research project, deciding which approach or approaches will answer the question. Over my career, I've come to the belief that most important questions, not the routine ones that might surface all the time, but the key ones that get us at the root of problems, require multiple methods. We don't want to know just if a particular pedagogical or policy approach works, but also why it does or doesn't, under what circumstances it works best, and how it can best be translated into practice. These questions are complex and often require combining quantitative data with interviews, observations, focus groups, and the likes. Therefore, over your career, keep design appropriate to the question in mind, and keep yourself up to date on a variety of research approaches. Second, I've come to believe very strongly in replication, in repeating studies in different settings. This is partly because of my line of work, policy research, which is addressed at users who don't just want to know that a particular policy approach would be helpful in another state, but they want to know that it would be helpful in their own context. And they don't want a study that just said it works somewhere else. But replication is also important because repeated studies can verify or question the original findings, as we're learning in the sciences where replication is becoming more common. Our problem is that academic tradition doesn't value replication, as it should. Our heavy emphasis on originality, in quotes, for dissertations, hiring, tenure, and promotion decisions drives research to narrow subspecializations and disdains replication as unoriginal. As I leave the academy formally, it's my strong desire that we revisit our traditional emphasis on the original, try to redefine it, lest it keep us from redoing or reconsidering or reevaluating important work in various contexts to make it more useful, and lest it drive us to the ever more arcane. Another type of essential work that is undervalued by academic institutions is synthesis. We don't credit literature reviews with the same status as original studies. Yet every research user I've ever worked with to apply research findings has asked me where this latest study fits into the existing body of knowledge. They want to know the weight of the evidence, not just the findings of a single study. And they want researchers to help them sort through the evidence. That means we must encourage, not discourage, syntheses, because good syntheses are critical to making knowledge usable. Finally, and perhaps this should go without saying, all of us need to make our research accessible to policymakers, practitioners, and the general public. Pruning our presentations of jargon and even the whiff of pedantry increases the likelihood that the knowledge we've created will reach the intended audience and deliver tangible benefits to society. Now, I could point to dozens of examples of research produced by and disseminated by teachers, college, faculty, students, alumni, et cetera, alone that has not only shaped public policy, but also improved students' li people's lives. But I'm going to give you one example that's getting a lot of attention lately. TC's Community College Research Center, founded and led by our next president, Tom Bailey. Community colleges serve more than half of all low-income students and students of color, 
So, as Tom says, they should be central to any agenda for educational equity. Yet, 20 years ago, these institutions equated success with access. As long as they enrolled a lot of students, the thinking went, they were doing their job. CCRC has shifted that paradigm to providing quality education and assuring that students complete their degrees, equipped with the skills to continue college and pursue more good jobs and meaningful careers. CCRC researchers have led the nation in assessing strategies for achieving those goals, including dual enrollment, remedial education, digital learning, financial aid, career and workforce education, and institutional financing. They've conducted painstaking long-term studies, following students for years and using cutting-edge data analysis to determine what really works, for whom, and why. For example, CCRC's Judith Scott Clayton has found that a per high percentage of students are unnecessarily placed in remedial courses, which cost money but award no credits, often derailing students from graduating. She has proven that remedial assignments based on high school grade point averages would be more accurate than, on the, than the placement tests used by community college. And she's demonstrated that a quarter of remedial students would pass regular college courses with a B or higher. As a direct result of that work, nearly 60% of public two-year institutions are now using multiple measures for placement in college-level math courses, up from just 27% in 2011. And 51% are doing the same reading and writing placement, up from 19%. Remediation rates have been dropping during that period, and a number of states have instituted reforms that give students more options for completing remediation quickly. Tom and Professor Judith Scott Clayton and all, all the researchers at CCRC have also shown that students more often complete their degrees when they follow a guided pathways approach. Developing a program-centered academic plan early on rather than choosing courses cafeteria style. This research has been extremely influential. More than 250 colleges are now implementing the Guided Pathways model. And this research has been beneficial. Students at colleges that adopted the model early on are earning more credits in their first year and completing gateway courses in math, English, and courses in their chosen areas in greater numbers. And best of all, these results suggest that these schools will achieve higher completion rates over a longer period, which has been the primary objective of this research from the outset. Graduates, all great institutions of higher learning do research and scholarship. What sets Teachers College apart is also what sets you apart. You've been co-investigators and co-authors on groundbreaking research aimed at directly addressing the world's most challenging problems particularly those that fall hardest on marginalized, vulnerable, and disadvantaged citizens and populations. You've contributed to, to faculty research on so many issues, problems, and phenomena. They include race-based traumatic stress, teaching methods for inclusive classrooms, higher education funding, probability problem-solving strategies, the use of science teaching to improve the health of urban teens, the effective exercise on efforts to quit drinking and smoking, learning agility, emotional resilience, the effect of poverty on brain development, the adaptation of interpersonal therapy to help populations affected by war, pandemic, refugee crises, or natural disasters, and the creation of public policies that promote positive outcomes in education and health. And of course, you've created new knowledge yourself as the titles of your dissertation suggest. You all have on your seats a pamphlet with those titles. I hope you, I hope you read every title. I'm just gonna mention four as examples. <laughs> Basic relational concept and verbal behavior development in preschool children with and without autism spectrum disorder. Disabling the school to prison pipeline, a mixed method study of the relationship between special education and arrest. 
mobile technology in science classrooms using iPad-enabled constructivist learning to promote collaborative problem solving and chemistry learning, and feeling understood the lived experience of culturally competent nursing care as perceived by patients of Chinese ethnicities. You can see uh, the range, uh, which is tremendous. You can also see the value and the fact that these dissertations, like TC Research more generally, address critical problems. There are enormous challenges facing society, but my faculty colleagues and I are optimistic about the future because we have taken the full measure of your talents, integrity, and readiness. We're confident that individually and collectively, you will contribute to the betterment of society through well-designed, well-executed, and accessible research. This is your time. Keep bright the chain of the pursuit of knowledge for the public good that began with the founding of Teachers College. And as researchers, as scholars, Remember the physicist David Deutsch's observation that all failures, all evils are due to insufficient knowledge. In other words, when it comes to improving the world, you can never know, replicate, or synthesize too much. Congratulations. We have now reached the moment in this ceremony when we honor an extraordinary individual whose life's work has advanced the cause of education while upholding TC's core mission to foster excellence and equity in the fields we serve. This year, we honor four preeminent scholars and practitioners, Jelani Cobb, Eric Holder, Helene Gale, and Walter Michelle. I am pleased to welcome TC Professor Loudon Jerome, joined by Provost Thomas James, to introduce Walter Michelle. Thank you. Good afternoon and congratulations, graduates. It is my pleasure to invite our medalist, Walter Michelle, to join us at the podium. Walter Michel, the power of truly great science grows stronger with time. Witness your famed marshmallow experiments, begun in the late 1960s, which have shown that a child's ability to delay gratification correlates with subsequent greater success in life. This seminal project has made willpower and impulse control essential subjects for empirical study. Furthermore, in today's era of smartphones, 24-hour media, one-click shopping, and children raised in front of TV and computer screens, your historic contributions to the psychology of self-regulation have become more relevant than ever. Indeed, your work has deeply influenced politics, economics, sports, anthropology, medicine, and other fields. And it has informed a new understanding that schools can function as sites of social and emotional learning, in addition to offering more traditional academic preparation. Your reputation as one of the preeminent psychologists of the 20th and 21st centuries does not derive from one experiment alone, nor even from the half century of follow-up, revision, and updating you have devoted to that experiment. You also have given parents, educators, and psychologists effective tools for helping those in their care to manage their behaviors and to take greater control over their futures. With your work entitled Personality and Assessment, you turn trait state theory on its head by showing that individuals' behaviors in given contexts depend on situational cues and perceived outcomes rather than on broadly defined personality traits. And through teaching and service to professional societies and journals, 
you have helped to create a receptive environment for these and other new ideas that have profoundly influenced the field of psychology and the study of personality. Walter Michel, for ingeniously revealing the influence of our natural impulses on our psychological, educational, and health outcomes, for demonstrating the complex interplay between our psyches and our social worlds, and providing our abilities and potential are not fixed at birth, and for empowering us to take command of our own lives, we proudly present you with the Teachers College Medal for Distinguished Service. For those of you who are inclined uh, to pray, pray that the microphone works well. <laughs> I want to thank President Furman, Provost James, Mr. Leclerc, and the Board of Trustees, and also to thank Professor Jaromi, Jarmo excuse me, and the Faculty of Teachers College for this very special honor. And of course, my thanks to all of the doctoral graduates for welcoming me here today. I deeply appreciate this recognition of my contributions to education from this remarkable educational institution that I have long admired just across the street from my own office at Columbia. This award means much to me, and I am grateful to you for it. And it's a special pleasure for me to congratulate my about-to-be-hooded new doctoral colleagues. I'm delighted and honored to address and welcome you. Congratulations, class of 2018, for earning your doctorates from the oldest, and in my eyes, most distinguished teachers college in the United States. You worked hard, you learned much, you did much, you got excited, you got frustrated, you filled out endless forms, I know because I looked. <laughs> and all this while doing an enormous amount of other stuff, probably with half your attention on the diverse non-academic responsibilities of your complex, very adult lives. Most of you were not looking to find yourselves like so many freshly minted college graduates. You already knew who you were and had a pretty good idea who you wanted to become. And you struggled to make it possible for you to do even more with your lives and careers. Bravo to each and every one of you. I can't imagine what you must have gone through to reach this point in life to get these doctoral hoods around your shoulders. The effort and commitment it took, the sacrifices you made, the delays of gratification you endured, you personify the current phrases for the qualities that enable success, resilience, commitment, persistence, self-regulation, grit, and so on. You've worked and waited a long time on life's endless marshmallow tests. Bravo to you. Bravo also to your families and friends who helped you in your long journey. Please join me in enthusiastically applauding the class of 2018.
I thought when I accepted this wonderful honor that that's all I'd have to say today and you could get hooded in an orderly fashion and then march out and have a roaring celebration. But getting this medal comes with giving a speech. Fortunately, no longer than almost 10 to 15 minutes that I'm supposed to make. I'm used to giving talks in my 61 years of teaching and 88 years of living, but they usually come with about 40 PowerPoints followed by a question period. Don't be afraid, no PowerPoints today and no question period. My congratulations and best wishes to you include the sincere hope that you will do much good in your widely diverse roles as educators and psychologists trained explicitly for leadership roles. The world needs you. Your doctoral degrees will open new opportunities and choices for you. I hope you will make good ones and that you will use your new options wisely and well, and that you will continue to persist with courage and tenacity when you run into the inevitable obstacles and frustrations along the route. Above all, I wish you great good luck. Looking back at my own life choices, I don't remember if I attended my PhD graduation ceremony in 1956. And if I did, I have zero memory of what any speaker there might have said. <laughs> but I clearly recall the way I chose my graduate school. I selected Ohio State because it offered me $50 more towards a PhD in clinical psychology than the alternatives. But I, but I got very lucky. I got very lucky. I stumbled into a place that changed my life. I want to share with you one of the experiences that looking back meant most to me when I was working for that doctorate in clinical psychology at Ohio State. I still try to recall it when I need it most in my own life. As part of my clinical training, I worked with the amazing George A. Kelly, who wrote The Psychology of Personal Constructs in the early 1950s, anticipating the cognitive revolution in psychology by more than 20 years. The experience I'll never forget was when I watched Kelly doing therapy with a distressed young woman, Teresa, a graduate student in another department. She was becoming increasingly upset and anxious, feeling that she could no longer manage her life. In the first two therapy sessions, Kelly was attentive, but almost completely silent. In the third session, her agitation seemed to peak as she exclaimed tearfully that she was afraid she was losing it and begged Dr. Kelly to answer her question. Am I falling apart? Kelly slowly, very slowly, took off his glasses and brought his face very close to hers, stared straight into her eyes and asked, would you like to? <laughs> Teresa was stunned. She seemed immensely relieved as if a huge rock had dropped from her shoulders. It had not occurred to her that it might be within her power to change, that she did not have to fall apart. It was up to her. She actually had a choice. In the jargon of psychology, the quality that Dr. Kelly was helping Teresa to develop was the sense of having choice and agency. I can become agentic. I can rethink or reconstruct experiences constructively in alternative and better ways. Yes, I can. I don't have to be the victim of my biography. Looking back, I think what Kelly taught me motivated much of my research on self-control and emotional self-regulation. It drove my attempts to make what 
used to be called willpower, less mysterious so that the cognitive and emotional skills that enable it can be untangled and identified. The good news is that they can be taught to help people become more agentic and to have more real choices and freedom in their lives. Happily, there now are concerted efforts in many schools to systematically incorporate into the school curriculum the teaching of cognitive and emotional skills and strategies that enhance students' chances for building satisfying and successful lives, for making good choices, and for developing what it takes to reach important goals. In education, like in Dickens's Tale of Two Cities, it may be the best of times and also the worst of times. George, a young man I met a few years ago, had both experiences. George grew up in one of the most impoverished areas of New York South Bronx. He was born in 1993 in Ecuador. When he was five, he and his parents immigrated to the South Bronx with little money. The family lived together in one room, and George was enrolled in a public school four blocks away. I met him when he was 19, and we talked about his first experiences there. He told me, quote, I spoke no English. They put me into a bilingual class. My teacher was nice. It was just a mess. People running everywhere, screaming, adults screaming, total confusion, pushed around, terrified, no instruction. I got into a few fights and was constantly surrounded by adults who directly and indirectly told me and my, and my classmates I was getting nowhere. Why do I even bother trying? I remember my second grade teacher yelling over my rowdy class. It's not like you'll actually make anything of yourselves, and it stayed that way for four years. When George was nine years old, his family won the lottery that let him enter a KIPP school, the, the KIPP Knowledge is Power program, the charter school that he says, quote, saved my life. In his words, the first time I came to that school in the, is the first time anyone believed in me. My parents encouraged me, but as parents without knowledge, this school encouraged me with knowledge and gave me, quote, we believe in you, so let's do this. Here are the resources, the long hours, the orchestra, the focus on character and college preparation, the tough love, and the positive expectations. All of you will go to college. It's showing that you care by being very, very honest. If you make a mistake and do something that does, doesn't make you smart, they show you what you need to do, and you know they do it because they care. In that school, quote, people told me what they wanted out of me without screaming. And what they wanted was for my own good and everyone else's, plus lots and lots of positive reinforcements for doing well and for everything good I did. When you do the right thing, the right things happen. When you do the bad, wrong things, the bad things happen. When I last talked with George, he was doing extremely well, working towards his bachelor's degree on a full scholarship at Yale University. I asked him what he thought he would be if he had not won the lottery that allowed him to transfer to the school that saved him. And he said, without it, I absolutely would be hanging in the streets looking for a job. What was at the root of his transformation from feeling totally adrift at age nine to becoming a successful Yale undergraduate, I asked him. And he said, learning to have self-control, being honest, being kind to my teammates, being polite, never settling for what I have, and asking the big questions were all things that led to my success. 
When I'm asked, isn't the future already pre-wired and visible in the child from the very start? Isn't that what the marshmallow test tells us? George's life is my answer. He surely had much good pre-wiring and potential, but as he emphasizes, there is no way his life would be unfolding as it is if he had not been, quote, saved by that school. It allowed George to go from being adrift to launching a fulfilling life. George would not have benefited so much from this kind of program if he had not worked so hard from age nine on. It's not just George and it's not just the world of mentors, models, resources, and opportunities that his good school gave him. It is both nature and nurture, not in opposition, but influencing each other reciprocally as their boundaries blur. How a person interacts with that world of opportunities and constraints drives the life that unfolds. The sobering thought is that it took winning a lottery to give George his chance. Your doctorates prepared you for becoming leaders in education, psychology, and health in a dizzying range of contexts, many not even in schools. But you have the training and the credentials, the skills, the resilience, and the passion and creativity to make a difference, to have impact, to improve the educational world broadly defined, and in the original Latin meaning of the word educate, to draw forth, to lead, to take someone from one place to another, from ignorance to knowledge, from aggression and prejudice to empathy and understanding, from irrationality and fictions to the use of reason and the scientific method in the search for truth, and from the kind of school in which George felt lost and hopeless to the kind that saved his life. Finally, I want to take a moment here to express my own gratitude to the teachers, educators, and public schools of this country. I escaped with my family from Vienna in 1938 when I was eight years old and the Nazis took over in Austria. When we arrived here as penniless refugees, although, USA, although the USA was still at the tail end of the Great Depression, I did not need to win a lottery. The American public school education system took me from PS 48 in Brooklyn to Shallow Junior High to New Utrecht High to my City College master's degree in clinical psychology and then to Ohio State for my doctorate. I will always be grateful for that voyage. It made my life possible. The education pioneer John Dewey at Teachers College almost 100 years ago noted that education is to help people realize their full potential and their ability to use their skills for the greater good. In the centuries since Dewey, scientific progress has been made in unpacking the cognitive and emotional skills that enable people to have agency, to have real choice, and the chance to reach their goals and to make the most of their lives and hopefully to make the world a bit of a better place. You have all spent years developing those skills, practicing how to nurture them and how to create the conditions needed to teach them and use them effectively in diverse contexts. As you move on with your new doctors into the next stage of your journey, I salute you. You're on a worthy mission, a noble mission, and it is hard to think of one that is more urgently needed. I hope you will save many lives. Good luck and best wishes. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nita Baksani and William Sauerland, accompanied by Tyreek Antoine Jackson, Katie Kresick, Elsa Lee, 
and Robert Roche, joined by members of the Singers Workshop, candidates of the Music and Music Education Department of Arts and Humanities.
And now, the hooding of our graduates by Provost Thomas James. Department Chair William Gaudelli for the Department of Arts and Humanities. So proud of our music program and students and their lovely rendition. Thank you so much for setting this tone. The Department of Arts and Humanities has six doctoral programs, including ones in art, music, history, philosophy, linguistics, English, and social studies, adding a seventh in dance education very shortly. These faculties and their doctoral students engage in a wide range of studies, from discourse analyses of language to philosophical examinations of great thinking to histories of people previously unexamined to music that sinks in the rhythm of democracy to art that is syncopated by digital technology to representations of teachers and their craft. Their doctoral studies are as diverse as the 40 faculty and 100 plus doctoral students in the department's care. What unites them? All of these studies are rooted in a very basic question. What does it mean to be human? And how can the humanities and the arts serve to promote human flourishing? These are the big ideas that animate our teaching and scholarship. So after today, these doctoral students will be given the honorific title of doctor. Let them be called doctor, not for the social status that it brings, but for the opportunity to promote justice, peace, equity, and flourishing in their fields of work. And please, don't let them be called doctor at home. No family, no spouse, no child, no sibling, no parent should have to endure that. And with this reminder of celebratory humility, it is my humble honor to call them forth for all the greatness that awaits. Hyun Ju Yu. Danielle Filippiak. Lee Ann Holland. Benjamin Villarreal. Tara Thompson. Adam Wolfsdorf. Christian Gregory. Laya Sole Coramina. Jessica Jagtiani. Dina Lutfi. <laughs> Brian Bolfer. <laughs> Betty Ann Driver. Ryan Goble. Adam Tremontano. Okay. 
Patrick Scanlon. Ken Hakoda. Moira Persh. Brennan Dubose. <laughs> Adam Faulkner. Ruth Aman. Mariam Alakani. Esther Lou Harris. Tammy E. Emily Perkins. <laughs> Teresa Kim. <laughs> Catherine De Lazaro. Maya Pindike. <laughs> Jason Gaines. Catherine Kresek. William Sauerland. Yay. Nita Baksani. Robert Roche. and Tyreek Jackson. This concludes the hooding of the doctoral graduates from Arts and Humanities. Department Chair Carol Ewing Garber for the Department of Biobehavioral Sciences. On behalf of the faculty and staff of the Department of Biobehavioral Sciences, let me extend our heartfelt congratulations to all our graduates and their families on your incredible accomplishments. Our students are brilliant, bold, and spirited. The Department of Biobehavioral Sciences offers programs in communication, sciences and disorders, physical education, movement sciences and kinesiology, and neurosciences. Our research focuses on the application of the biological, physiological, behavioral, cognitive, and sociocultural sciences underlying human communications, movement, and function to clinical, educational, and community settings. The scientific knowledge obtained from research in these specialized fields is applied to enhance the educational, functional, and communicative capability and health of disabled and non-disabled people of all ages and health status. 
Our doctoral graduates will go on to assume challenging research, academic, and professional roles in educational, clinical, governmental, and non-governmental settings. Now, I'm very proud to introduce to you the 2018 doctoral graduates from the Department of Biobehavioral Sciences. Aston Kyle McCullough. Mara Simon. Mary Elizabeth Gillis. Alexis Sideropoulos. Sanaz Nosrat. Lori Bishop. Daniel Geller. Ina Freeman. Diana Moya Sapulvada. Lisa Levinson. This concludes the graduates of the Department of Biobehavioral Sciences. Department Chair George Bonanno for the Department of Counseling and Clinical Psychology. Hello. People are sometimes confused to learn that psychology is part of teacher's college. Sometimes when I speak in places, people ask me why I'm teaching in a school of education. Let's fix that. The full name of Teachers College, as you've already heard, is in fact Teachers College Columbia University, a graduate school of education, health, and psychology. Historically, psychology has always played a huge role in Teachers College. Many famous psychologists have come through here, teaching and as students. Today, psychology at Teachers College is thriving. The Department of Counseling and Clinical Psychology is thriving. We are comprised of two outstanding doctoral programs, counseling psychology and clinical psychology. Both of these programs are tops in their areas. Both programs use what is called the scientist-practitioner model. What that means is that as developing practitioners, our doctoral students must learn to think like scientists. And as developing scientists, they must learn to think as clinicians would. They must think as a scientist would think about mental health problems, about societal problems. Entry into these two programs is very, very highly selective. To put it bluntly, the students we select, the students who will be hooded today, are the cream of the crop. These students have worked very hard, and they have done great things. They are incredibly talented, incredibly accomplished, published and innovating, and they are breaking new ground. And it is my great pleasure now to read their names. Brian Chang. <laughs> Amelia Dean Walker. Nicole Yaskowitz. Elizabeth Hernandez. Susan Mao.
Adam Breslow. Joyce Wa Young. Tasha Prosper. Matteo Malgaroli. Giuseppe Geraci. Giuseppe Geraci. I will also add Lieutenant Colonel Giuseppe Geraci. And that concludes the students from the Department of Counseling and Clinical Psychology. Professor Daniel Friedrich for the Department of Curriculum and Teaching. Good afternoon. This year's doctoral graduates from the Department of Curriculum and Teaching have done an impressive job at embodying the mission of the department to provide critical analysis of the ways in which curriculum, teaching, and schooling contribute to social inequalities and counter that with a commitment to educating for social justice. The tremendous research produced by these scholars bring to light the complexity of teaching, learning, and schooling in these difficult times. But most importantly, they give us the tools to imagine the world otherwise, and they invite us to build that world with them. Please join me in recognizing these graduates and their contributions to critically complicating our ideas of teaching, learning, and schooling. Tran Wynne Templeton. Erika Colmenares. Karishma Desai. Victoria Parra. <laughs> Kelly Johnston. Kelly Gavin Zuckerman. Robin Cochi Gonzalez. Mia Hood. Sunny McDevitt. Makila Myers. Courtney Rose. Amy Tondro. Allison Rumberger. Daniel Ferguson. Laura Vernikov. Seema Bernstein. Patricia Gibson. Linda Choi. Lisa Edstrom.
Mamie Hostetter. Mary Newberry. This concludes the hooding of the doctoral graduates from Curriculum and Teaching. Department Chair Aaron Pallas for the Department of Education Policy and Social Analysis. The Department of Education Policy and Social Analysis, or EPSA as we refer to it, would not exist without the leadership and vision of Teachers College President Susan Furman. We are grateful to her for creating the department and look forward to her joining our EPSA community as she moves into the next phase of her remarkable career. The graduates and faculty of EPSA study how social, political, economic, and legal contexts influence the behavior of education systems from early childhood through post-secondary education. We look at where education policies come from and their consequences for the broadly shared goals and values of equity, efficiency, and community. I'm proud to present the 2018 doctoral graduates of the Department of Education Policy and Social Analysis. David Nitkin. Martha Kluttig. Jacqueline Duran. Catherine Hill. Hannah Lar. Jennifer Salmon. Xiao Dao Ran. Shuang Shuang Liu. David Houston. Nathan Walker. Samuel Abrams. Miguel Martinez. That concludes the EPSA graduates. Congratulations, graduates. Department Chair Dolores Perrin for the Department of Health and Behavior Studies. Good afternoon. The Department of Health and Behavior Studies consists of clusters of programs in health, applied educational psychology, and special education. Our collective mission is to improve the health, learning, and social well-being of children and adults in schools and other settings. On behalf of our department, I want to present to you the wonderful people who have worked so hard to earn their doctorates and appear before you today. And before I begin, I want to thank you, the parents, partners, relatives, and other persons for the invaluable support you've provided to help our students accomplish so much. Congratulations, graduates. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sonia Aurora. Morgan Friedman. Go 
Rhonda Ruffsfold. Damien LaRocque. <laughs> Noor Syed. <laughs> Melinda Abbott. <laughs> Aaron Shearer. <laughs> Catherine. Maria Schlatter. William Hall. Ashley Greer. Georgette Morgan. Madeline Foranash Frank. Catherine Cameron. Laura Darcy. Alexandria Lanter. Caroline Crosby. Kelly Kleinert. Emmy Morillas. Andrea Randolph Krisova. Suzanne Robinson Davis. George Padilla. Alessandro Bellantono. Zoe Chio. Congratulations. Vivian Song. Christina Alvarez. Rachel Paul. Avigdor Arad. Christina Ricardo. Elizabeth Baquero. Congratulations. Thank you. Marvin Dot Fullwood. This concludes the hooding of the doctoral, doctoral graduates of the Health and Behavior Studies Department. Department Chair James Corter for the Department of Human Development. The Department of Human Development is comprised of programs in cognitive science and education, developmental psychology, measurement and evaluation, applied statistics and learning analytics. Faculty and students in the department conduct research in human learning on the development of social emotional skills, create state of the art testing tools, and develop techniques to use data in new, effective, and valid ways. These students go forth into the world as graduates to continue this work in universities, schools, government agencies, research organizations, and businesses.
Ilya Lyachevsky. Marissa Morin. Melissa Cesarano. Allison Lee. Thank you so much. Tian Tian Jin. Yang Zhang. Laura Malkovich. <laughs> Vasilikis Yor Willis Shari. Ma Victoria Alameda. Colleen Yushkanowski. John, Shi, John Chen Shi. <laughs> Bright Soa. Hey, almost last. <laughs> Eric Muller. Ruki Sakdeva. This concludes the hooding of the doctoral candidates from human development. Department Chair Hervé Varin for the Department of International and Transcultural Studies. Uh, my colleagues and I are very happy, very proud to present our new peers. They come from all over the world, and they went all over the world. They went to Korea, to Congo. They went across the street to Columbia and Harvard hackathons. They went to bars and restaurants in Midtown. They went to hospitals, weddings, and other wonderful places. Above all, they came back and reported to us what human beings can do. They moved our mission through their work. First, to understand all education as a global, global process in, involving all people in all walks of life, here and there, now and then. Second, to analyze educational processes in their full social and cultural context. And third, to develop and evaluate policies curricula and pedagogies, particularly in the most difficult settings, refugee camps, indigenous villages, and other places recovering from conflict and violence. And so I am proud to present a small and non-random sample of our graduates. <laughs> Jessica, Young Jessica Youngman Lee. Kyle Long. And these two conclude. <laughs> Professor Erica Walker for the Department of Mathematics, Science, and Technology. On behalf of the faculty of the Department of Mathematics, Science, and Technology, I'd like to congratulate our wonderful graduates. They hail from our three programs, Mathematics Education, Science Education, and Communication Media and Learning Technologies Design. They are outstanding educators, researchers, 
designers, developers, and thinkers in creative and diverse disciplines. We as faculty have been privileged to work with them and learn with them during their doctoral studies, and we are eager to see what they do next. Our heartiest congratulations to our graduates and to all of you, their family and friends. Gregory Benoit. <laughs> Christina Hopkins. Gabor Salopek. John. John Russell. Peter Hillman. Talia Nakamson. Christina Constantino. Gifty Asamani. Amanda Levy. Melody Ting. Emily Balin. <laughs> Sophie Lamb. <laughs> Will McGuffey. <laughs> Bukuri Jochi. Hong Yuan. Meng Meng Sao. Brandy Wade. This concludes the hitting of the doctoral graduates of the Department of Mathematics, Science, and Technology. Department Chair William Baldwin for the Department of Organization and Leadership. Good afternoon. At the doctoral level, the Department of Organization and Leadership is composed of five intellectually vibrant programs. The Adult Learning and Leadership Program prepares graduates for leadership roles in addressing lifelong learning and developmental needs of individuals, teams, organizations, and societal institutions. The Executive Program for Nurses prepares graduates to be leaders in multidisciplinary roles that encompass business and administration and finance, healthcare law, nursing and hospital administration, and human relations. The program in social organizational psychology prepares graduates to conduct research that drives organizational change in the service of social equality and to engage in practice with individuals, teams, and organizations to help them adapt to an ever-changing environment with the aim of creating a better, more just world. The education leadership programs prepare graduates for thoughtful and strategic leadership in schools, school systems, and educational organizations, and to be effective change agents in those roles. And the doctoral program in higher and post-secondary education, of which I'm a graduate some almost 40 years ago, educates scholars and scholar practitioners who endeavor to explore and enhance the individual and societal benefits of a college degree. We celebrate and believe in diversity, equity, and excellence in higher education. And on that note of celebration, I'm honored on behalf 
of my faculty, staff, and students to celebrate the 2018 doctoral graduates from organization and leadership. Lauren Kitanachi Francois. Brittany Chambers. And Tia Moore Allen. Let's see if I get this one. Brian J. Alm. Clarice Marie Mendoza. Sophia Satterwhite. Sure Onand. Nicole Morant. Brian Mitra. Claire Davis. Andre Harper. Chen Wang. Meiko Lin. Michelle Romano. Deborah Little. Allison Salovan. Aaron Hilgart. Ginevra Drinko. Demarcus Pagis. Cecilia Jackson. Marvin Lewis Robinson III. Brian Dashu. Chelsea Saunders. Maria Ater. And that concludes the graduates from the Department of Organization and Leadership. Please join us in celebrating the class of 2018. Ladies and gentlemen, Marion Boltby, president of the Teachers College Alumni Association. Alumni. Let me say that again. Alumni. <laughs> it is my distinct pleasure to formally welcome you into the Teachers College Alumni Association. As you stand here before this esteemed group, and alongside your peers, we look on with great pride. Today, you join our Alumni Association, a network of over 20,000 professionals, 90,000 professionals, comprised of graduates from a myriad of academic backgrounds and all walks of life. 
who have created an incredible legacy. You will now be a part of that legacy. Your fellow Teachers College alumni have made a global impact, shaping many fields of inquiry and practice. They have done so through their leadership, tenacity, experience, and wisdom. They have also done so because of the people like the ones around you today who form your support systems and network of peer mentors. Many would argue that they have done so because of their teacher's college preparation. We know that you too will follow in these footsteps and make your own mark. Just as you needed support during your time at TC, we know you will need similar resources as you embark on your careers. And we encourage you to look to Teachers College for that support. I'm here today to tell you how valuable your participation in our Alumni Association can be. We are colleagues and collaborators, supporters and challengers, mentors and mentees, and most importantly, we are your peers. What keeps us all together is our alma mater, Teachers College. While everyone has had a different journey, I'm certain that no one's path leading to this time and place was free of challenges. I'm also certain that along the way you found inspiration, insight, and joy. And many of you have developed friendships that will become lifelong. I encourage you to stay connected to your classmates as you move forward in your careers and to tap into the deep pool of expertise and knowledge offered by the broader TC community. We hope to see you at future alumni events and also highlighted in future newsletters. Know that you will always have a home in TC's vibrant community. On behalf of your fellow alumni, we wish you all the best in your endeavors. Congratulations and welcome to the Teachers College Alumni Association. Ladies and gentlemen, TC Trustee Paul LeClaire. On behalf of all of my fellow trustees of Teachers College, I wish to congratulate each and every one of you on your extraordinary achievements. We thank your families and your friends, very boisterous they were, for joining with the faculty and staff of Teachers College to recognize our great doctoral candidates of the class of 2018. We know we're positive that your contributions to improving the lives of your fellow human beings will become part of the great TC legacy and make us ever more proud of you. Wise words have been spoken. Hoods symbolic of the doctoral degree have been received. Joy has reigned in this great and sacred hall. And so I now declare these convocation exercises to be concluded. Goodbye, good luck, and Godspeed to you all. Thank you.